and it um, muzzles us uh, inside an institution that is supposed to be public. Tonight, APTN News fights a proposed publication ban in the bail hearing of two Indigenous sisters. One of our committee members said, I don't even allow my daughter to take cabs in this city. Plus, new solutions proposed to tackle taxi woes in Winnipeg. I never really understood what sexual assault or abuse or any of that kind of stuff um, meant. And an Eskasoni First Nation poet channels her pain into prose. Good evening, Tanse, and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. Saskatchewan Justice is seeking to muzzle media in the case of two Soto sisters. The Crown wants a publication ban on their upcoming bail hearing, which could be their first step towards freedom. On Monday, advocates for the two sisters asked the Saskatchewan government to withdraw the application. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. Odelia and Nerissa Cusance have been in prison for almost three decades for the murder of Joseph Anthony Dolph, a crime their cousin pleaded guilty to in the 1990s. They're due for a bail hearing later this month, one that could potentially set them free. But Saskatchewan prosecutor Kelly Cape wants to prohibit media coverage of it. At a virtual press conference Monday morning, Senator Kim Pate says this is just plain wrong. Then add to that the provincial government is trying to seek a publication ban. Uh, that tells us that there is something, you know, when it smells, when it, you know, it looks like it, there's a problem, as has already been said by others, chances are there is something significantly wrong with how this case was handled. Earlier this year, Federal Justice Minister David Lametti committed to a review of the sisters' convictions, saying a miscarriage of justice may likely have occurred. But Congress of Aboriginal Peoples Vice Chief Kim Bode says the Saskatchewan government has been uncooperative at every turn. Saskatchewan government has been non-compliant in anything, any requests that, that we've made towards them, uh, information that we wanted, uh, anything like that. Nicole Porter has worked with the Cusan sisters. She says the publication ban is part of an overall strategy by the Saskatchewan government to keep them behind bars. We are seeking a remedy for these Indigenous women, yet at every corner we face resistance from the very government that falsely put them away in the first place. Saskatchewan Justice Respondent Supporter in a statement, court will decide the matter. Legal counsel for AP10 News is also challenging the publication ban. The bail hearing will take place in Yorkton, Saskatchewan, November 24th and 25th. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. Now, APTN News broke the Quezan sisters' story two years ago and have been following it ever since. Our extensive reporting has led to widespread media coverage of the case. And for more on the publication ban being proposed, here's a senior online reporter, Kathleen Martins. Kathleen, thanks so much for joining us. It's always great having you on our newscast. Um, so, first off, what do we know about why the Crown wants a publication ban on this bail hearing? Well, we don't know. We, we were, I have been trying to find out uh, on behalf of APTN for at least a month, trying to get what's called the Crown's Factum. It's a public document. It lays out their view of the case so far, and it would tell me if they're going to oppose uh, the Cusant sisters' bail next week and other facts. And it's a public document, but I've been stymied in trying to get it. And in the same time as that's been going on, I've been pushing, pushing uh, for the release. Suddenly the Crown just last week said, you know what, We're, we want a, not only a publication ban on covering the bail hearing, but we want all these records to be sealed. So what would the effect of this ban be? Well, it would be, it would be huge. I mean, we, we couldn't tell you, we couldn't report any anything about the evidence that we hear at the bail hearing. So we can't hear what the Crown, why the Crown is opposing bail. We can't hear if they have a new witness or new evidence. We won't, we won't be able to report that. And it um, muzzles us uh, inside an institution that is supposed to be public. And uh, Kathleen, why is it important that this bail hearing is made public? Well, I mean, press freedom is is uh, 
is a right under the charter and it is also uh, one of the pillars of the justice system that not only should justice be done but justice should be seen to be done so it is important that we are there uh, to bear witness, to hear what's going on, and to report that to the public, especially APTM's audience, which has been following this case closely while we've been reporting it over the last several years. And finally here, before we let you go, Kathleen, how is APTN National News fighting this proposed ban? Well, we've right away alerted the judge that we, we are opposed. Uh, we have a media lawyer who uh, is going to be in court next week. Uh, when the Crown makes its application before the judge and the defence responds to that, our lawyer will also have an opportunity to speak and make some of the arguments that, that I've already stated, that this is a public institution and that uh, press freedom is, a, is a, a right, and also that this is an important case when it comes to how Indigenous peoples are treated in the Canadian justice system, and that is of utmost importance to our audience at APTN News. It certainly is important. Uh, we'll have to leave it there, Kathleen, but we will certainly be keeping a close eye on this. Thanks so much for updating us on what's going on. You're welcome, Daryl. Thank you. A new group is partnering with Winnipeg Cab Companies to ensure safe transportation for Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people. The first of its kind project will see Indigenous women come together to address years of widespread concern with taxis in Winnipeg. They have partnered with two Winnipeg cab companies, Unicity and Duffy's, as well as the City of Winnipeg Department that oversees the industry. Janine Robinson Desjarlis says they hope to include rideshare companies and provide a safe space to file concerns. One of our committee members said, I don't even allow my daughter to take cabs in this city. And that really affected some of our, our new friends in the cab company. And they realized, okay, there's something we got to do here. We need to make an action plan right now. So that's what we're committed to today, moving forward with all of the details of who's coming on board with the city, the province, whoever, that has to be worked out. But what we're saying today as a committee is that we won't be taking no for an answer, that this is something that's urgent and needed and far overdue. You can learn lessons from emergency response. That's why a Nunavut nonprofit organization has set out to learn from Nunavut's response to the COVID pandemic. What they're learning, or what they're beginning to learn, may surprise you. An example, how did Nunavut feed more people during a pandemic? Kent Driscoll has more. Nunavut shut down due to the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020, right around St. Patrick's Day. Schools went remote, and you had to spend two weeks in isolation before you could fly into the territory. That's when the Caillou Gartit Health Research Centre started tracking data. When COVID emerged in 2020, we started uh, documenting and gathering information right away, starting in April, to uh, basically help draw, collect evidence that would drive decision making. What began to happen was unexpected. Inuit orcs handed out food vouchers, hunters increased their catches, and a Kaluit soup kitchen saw a gigantic drop in demand. Nunavut's pandemic response fed people, from country food to people offering food donations. For example, uh, in the early days of the pandemic, we saw a lot of people going out on the land, and we saw a huge spike in the amount of food being shared in the community. So more being harvested, more being shared. One of the big keys for the response in Nunavut was that members of communities started to take on the problems head on themselves. We're, we're learning a little bit more about uh, how people responded as individuals like by sp like spending two days a week just cooking meals and delivering them to single parents by um, uh, delivering food to elders who you know who were who were uh, remaining in their homes um, and really showcasing like the values of our communities where they really emerged. We can't predict the next territorial health crisis but we can learn from the previous one which fits Inuit society values like a glove. It's important that we're all prepared and that's you know that's grounded in Inuit values around preparedness and planning for the future and and that's what our center works to meet. There are 150 interviews into their study and hope to present the data widely. It's public data for the public and could help that public be ready for the next public health emergency. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Halloween. 
All right, it's time for a short break, but still to come, the Nietzsche Institute near Edmonton is moving again. Details next. Welcome back. The family of an Akwesasne Mohawk man thought they knew where their father was buried 26 years ago. So it was quite a shock when they heard his casket was found somewhere completely different a few months ago. Now they're looking for answers. Here's Annette Francis with that story. Mary Ann Jackson laid her father to rest 26 years ago. But this past summer, his casket was found about 75 metres away from where he was initially buried. She imagines the discovery. I just keep visualising it, you know, and it, it, it haunts me. Um, I know that he's at rest regardless. Jackson points out where his initially buried casket was found in mid-August at the St. Lawrence Cemetery. They had a cleanup crew come in and he was underneath rubble. Oh my God. The Donaldson Funeral Home said that they believe he was there for at several years, at least two and a half years before he was found. Oh my God. His initial burial site is over that way, behind the opposite side of that. At first, Akwesasne police didn't know who was in the casket and posted on Facebook asking for assistance in identifying the remains. They believed his name was Alfred. They described my father to a T that he died in, they buried in September and my father died in September. He was 65. The only thing they didn't have was the year, but according to the um, Donaldson's funeral home, I believe, they estimated his time, his years to be 65. Her father's name was Alfred Peters and about that age. So Jackson and other family members met with the Aquasasne police. We all agreed that it is him, but there's still the circumstances, like why? And it's all on the police, like, you know, Somebody's got to be accountable for this kind of garbage. It's just, it shouldn't even be happening. According to Constable Leanne O'Brien, the investigation is ongoing. But O'Brien says it looks like the casket had been moved by accident quite some time ago. Jackson and admits the there was no headstone marker, or marker you know. for her father. Even if he didn't have a marker, that's still, that's no excuse for that happening. For now, Jackson will try to hold on to better memories of her dad. He was a basket maker. He, he pounded logs and he came back here um, probably about 10, 15 years before he passed away. He was in Syracuse. And when he came back, he brought pound making back. He taught a lot of men to pound and make splints and make baskets and stuff like that. She you know, still wants that answers that and yeah. an apology. But I know that he's at rest regardless, but I don't know. I just. Someone has to take accountability, like, you know, at least say, we're sorry this happened. According to Constable O'Brien, there is no assigned caretaker of the graveyard. APTN reached out to the St. Lawrence Cemetery a number of times for comment, but did not receive a response. Meanwhile, Alfred Peters was reburied, but in a completely different part of the cemetery. And at Francis, APTN National News, Aquasasne. The Nietzsche Institute near Edmonton is moving again after its second eviction in two years. The school has trained over 15,000 people in narcotic prevention over its near 50-year history. APTN's Chris Stewart has more. A few staff members of the Nietzsche Institute are sharing perhaps a final meal here and memories of the Nietzsche Institute. Since 1974, the center has been training people how to help with addiction issues. Over 15,000 students. For decades, the institute shared this building with the Poundmakers Lodge treatment centers. The lodge helps those with addiction issues. In 2020, the Alberta government evicted the Nietzsche Institute from the provincially owned site so that Poundmaker could expand. Nietzsche set up in trailers that were on the property and have been using those since. They teach a few online courses from there. Live training for students in Saskatchewan and Nunavut used to be done in the building. Now the Institute goes to those locations. However, this spring, elders said the trailers may be sitting on potential unmarked graves. CEO Marilyn Buffalo says they knew they have to leave exactly. and find another location. But she says they were given a letter from the province on October 6, giving them one month to get out of the trailers. One month to get everything out.
Buffalo says the timing of the eviction couldn't be worse. There is a national health crisis currently playing out in every community across this country. And I don't mean just Indigenous communities. It's everywhere. And all we're trying to do as staff here at Nietzsche is to train people to learn to understand and to help our people in the communities. At a question period at the Alberta Legislature on December 6, 2019, both Indigenous Relations Minister Rick Wilson and then Premier Jason Kenney told the opposition that the Alberta government would help the Nietzsche Institute relocate. The Nietzsche Institute is currently occupying a strategic clinical space and we are open to working together to find a suitable alternative location. They need to use the space to treat patients. We'll find other space for the Nietzsche Institute. This is where we worship. Buffalo says no alternate locations were offered. I as a CEO here has not had any kind of offers from any one of them from, from the province nor the feds. So I don't know where you know, are they telling people that, that they've made offers? That is not true. Brenda Rain is an accountant with the Nietzsche Institute. She says the one-month eviction lacks any compassion. It just hurts. How can they be so cruel? How can the Alberta government feel, be so cruel? It feels like residential schools all over again. You know, we don't have a choice. It's you do what we say, otherwise we send the Mounties or the Calvary after you. It's the same bloody thing. Buffalo says they did manage to find another location themselves and are paying rent for it themselves with tuition funds. Nietzsche was previously not paying rent. And I want to um, put some confidence in Nietzsche today. We are not quitting even though yes our office has been taken from us again. Uh, we are resilient and we are ready to start uh, Monday morning in a new location. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Time for one final break. More news when we come back. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. This photo was taken by Ruth Chorney and shows her farm located near Greenwater Lake, Saskatchewan. This was sent in before some of the recent snowfall, so be sure to send an update, Ruth. If you want to be featured as our photo of the day, you can submit your photos by email to share at aptn.ca. All right, now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 0 degrees in St. John's and 5 in Halifax. Minus 4 in Happy Valley Goose Bay and minus 2 in Cartwright. Minus 2 in Val d'Or and plus 2 in Quebec City. Minus 2 in North Bay and plus 1 in Sault Ste. Marie. Minus 3 degrees in Timmins and minus 4 in Sioux Lookout. Minus 8 in snow in Churchill and minus 12 in Thompson. Minus 6 in Clear and Barrens River and minus 3 in snow in Winnipeg. Minus 6 in Estevan and minus 4 in North Battleford. Minus 1 in Buffalo Narrows and minus 3 in Stony Rapids. Moving west, minus 1 in Fort Chippewan and plus 1 in Clear and Peace River plus two in Edmonton and plus three in Calgary. Eight degrees and clear in Vancouver and seven in Bella Coola. Nine degrees in Sands Pit and minus four in Smithers. Minus 13 in Beaver Creek and minus 18 in snow in Old Crow. Minus nine in snow in Norman Wells and minus eight in Fort Simpson. Minus 8 in Fort McPherson and minus 12 in Anuvik. Minus 13 in Baker Lake and minus 15 in Chesterfield. Minus 18 in Aglulik and minus 13 in Akalawit. A Mi'kmaq woman turned her struggles with mental health into inspiration by publishing a book of poetry. She hopes it will help others cope with their own anxiety and depression. Angel Moore has the story. She was almost at the edge 
feet above nothing, about to let go. She closed her eyes. Her arms flew freely, heart beating through her chest, goosebumps over her arms. For the moment, she was free. That is Hannah Baptiste reading her poem called Images, describing how she used her imagination as an escape from abuse. I never really understood what I went through as a child. Never really understood what sexual assault or abuse or any of that kind of stuff um, meant. So I wrote this poem um, about how I would imagine things. Baptiste of the Escazoni First Nation published her first poetry book called Out of Darkness, inspired when she came to her community's healing gardens to reflect on her past. So out of darkness means a lot of the times in my situations I had to help myself out of darkness because I really believe in that save and um, nobody's going to come save you, you have to come save yourself. Baptiste designed the cover of the book. It follows Baptiste's journey through abuse, mental illness, and therapy. Um, it's about a girl that's trapped underneath these bob wires and being not being able to reach over and to reach the light. But all along she was able to do it because she was the light, her, she was the inner light. Edmund Morris, Baptiste's best friend, says the poems are an inspiration. Seeing her struggles made me realize like that I have dealt with some issues as well with my mental health. So seeing her being so open and vulnerable with people encouraged me to do the exact same thing and like seek help and Baptiste got help at the Escazoni Mental Health Service Center, where she now works as a youth worker. Angeline Denny, silly boy, director of the center, is proud Baptiste is sharing her journey. Yeah, we're just so excited to be able to actually read her book. We heard lots about it, but now uh, when we have the opportunity to read it, I'm definitely going to have, and hopefully she'll sign a copy for me. Losing a parent at a young age and a brother who died by suicide, Baptiste had to cope with anxiety, depression, and PTSD, wrote her pain in her poetry to share with others. It was like a lot of horrible things that I'd been through that I, I kept silent about for a long time, and I don't want to be silent anymore. I want to use my voice, and I'm hoping that it, it inspires other people to use their voices too. Baptiste will attend a book launch later this month in Toronto. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Escazoni, First Nation. Emma Morrison, a member of the Chapleau First Nation in Ontario, will represent Canada in the upcoming Miss World pageant. That's a first for a First Nations contestant. Morrison's first pageant was Miss North Ontario in 2017. She competed against 50 women from across Canada during a week-long competition in Toronto, taking the crown of Miss World Canada. Congratulations, Emma, and best of luck. All right, that's all we have for you tonight on APTN National News. For news anytime, you can check out our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. For all of us here, thank you for joining us. Miigwech, and have a great night.